Hello everybody. So uh, in the last uh, couple of lectures, we've been talking about the process of optical microscopy. We looked at uh, different configurations of the microscope. In some cases, you have the refle reflected light imaging and in other cases, we have uh, transmitted light imaging. The uh, purpose of the imaging is obviously to look at the contrast between different phases present in the same material. And we saw that the contrast was generally being generated by differential levels of absorption of the light that was passing through or different levels of reflectivity if it was the case for a reflected light microscopy. So reflectivity difference obviously comes from the densities of the different phases that are being imaged. The denser phases tend to reflect more light. Now we also discussed that uh, the resolution of uh, optical microscopy is getting limited because we are working in a band of wavelengths which are fairly large. To really cut down that wavelength, we need to actually start adopting other means of imaging. You already are familiar with X-ray imaging. So X-rays are able to penetrate very dense objects because of their high energies, right? And because of the extremely low wavelengths, we can actually resolve atomic level structure also with X-rays. However, uh, there was a lot of work done in the 1930s to 1940s where people looked at the power of using electrons for imaging. And scanning electron microscopy is one such technique that came about uh, which used electrons for imaging the surface morphology of objects as well as to look at compositional contrast that may be arising out of the electron backscatter from the specimen. Okay. So in this uh, uh, series of uh, lectures, we will take a look at the process of scanning electron microscopy and how we can interpret the images successfully to obtain the right kind of uh, understanding of the material characteristics of the microscale. We have already talked significantly about uh, preparation for scanning electron microscopy. In most cases for building materials, one of the common uh, strategies is to provide for a coating on the surface because building materials are mostly insulating or non-conducting as a result of which when electrons are used for imaging there may be a charge or build up of the electrons on top of the surface if the surface is not conducting. So in order to make the surface conducting, we deposit a layer of atoms of either carbon or gold palladium or chromium to ensure that there is conductivity on the surface and the electrons do not get charged. Okay. Um, you will see from the examples that we discussed that that is only one mode of imaging. The other mode obviously requires the sample to, to be impregnated by a low viscous epoxy resin and then polishing to a very fine level to ensure that you can actually get some good reflectivity or backscatter of the electrons from the sample surface. Okay. So we will take a look at both these kinds of operations of scanning electron microscopy. Right. So the simplest way to put forward is through the schematic diagram. As you can see here, uh, there is a source of electrons which is otherwise called the electron gun okay, from which the electrons or fast moving electrons come rapidly down the central axis of the SEM column, okay, which is likened to your optic axis in the microscopes. Okay. In the microscopes, the central beam of light that passes through the lenses constitutes the optic axis. So in this case, of course, all the electrons are made to move in a straight line or within that parallel beam of electrons to ensure that there is not too much straying of the electrons out of this central axis. Now how is that made possible? That is made possible by the use of magnetic lenses. These magnetic lenses by controlling the level of the magnetic field that you apply, you can actually control the path of the electrons and make them spiral down the optic axis. Okay. After the magnetic lenses, you have the objective lens system. The objective lens system consists of various parts including the scanning coils. So again please remember in the case of an electron microscopy all the lenses will simply be electromagnetic lenses. We are not talking about any optical lenses here, we are talking only about electromagnetic lenses. So in this case the control of the lens power or lens focus would be done by adjusting the magnetic field generated by these lenses. Okay. So the objective lens system consists of what are known as scanning coils and these scanning coils ensure that the electron beam follows a sort of a pattern on the specimen. So in other words, the specimen top is scanned by the electrons in a particular periodic interval. So you have a line scan and then you come to the next line and then you scan again with the line and then next line and so on and so forth. This is similar to 
the scanning that was done previously in the old computer monitors, the cathode ray tube monitors, right. So, the same idea applies here. So, we are basically scanning line by line and then the interactions that are generated from the specimen, right, interaction between the electrons which are bombarding the specimen and the specimen itself lead to the generation of what we call as backscatter electrons, secondary electrons and x-rays and all these are then detected using suitable detectors which are placed at critical locations just around the specimen and then they can actually capture all these electrons coming out. Okay, so, for example, this is a secondary electron detector that is placed at a very narrow angle because those are low energy electrons escaping from the surface and they do not need a very high energy to actually capture the uh, electrons by the detector. On the other hand, the backscatter detector is almost placed right around the optic axis or electron axis to ensure that the electrons that are undergoing elastic rebound with the sample are getting perfectly captured because they will the highest energy electrons will almost undergo an elastic rebound and come right up and at that location you will be able to capture the electrons quite well. We will look at the schematic and the actual type of detectors in just a few minutes. Okay, so, electromagnetic lenses are available in between there is a lens system that focus a beam of electrons that are accelerated through a large potential difference and this is basically the potential difference between the electron gun which is the cathode and another uh, a, a cap type uh, uh, system which is called the anode. Okay. So, when you have a potential difference anode is a positively charged electrode. So, electrons being negatively charged will move towards the anode and if you create a large enough potential difference you know that that potential difference will result in kinetic energy. So, it will increase the velocity of the electrons which will cause them to move very fast through the anode down the optic axis and then controlled by the magnetic lenses to ensure that all of them are on the central path directly going to the top of the specimen. Okay. So, let us look at the SEM column itself as to how the instrument is actually arranged. So, this is a picture of a typical scanning electron microscopy uh, system. So, you have a column and then you have a sample chamber. Okay. So, you have an SEM column which is composed of course of the electron gun. You have the alignment control which ensures that the gun is the electrons from the gun are going right down. There is an airlock valve provided at that location to ensure that okay, you can actually have a different system of evacuation when the electron beam enters this objective lens part. Okay. So, objective lens part consists of condenser lenses which ensure that the magnetic fields are adjusted in a way to keep the electrons down the optic axis. Then you have the objective aperture and scanning coil system which ensures that you get the scanning of the electron beam on the surface. The aperture basically controls the size of the electron beam. Just like in the light microscopy where aperture controls the amount of light getting onto the specimen here, it simply controls the size of the electron beam. So, just from first principles if you have a small aperture what will happen to your resolution? It will improve right. The smaller the width of the electron beam the greater the detail that you will see in very short distances. So, resolution improvement can be done by reducing the aperture, but if you reduce the aperture the amount of light or amount of electrons intensity of the electron beam will get reduced. Okay. So, you have to ensure that you are choosing the right sort of settings for your imaging system we will come back to that discussion later. Okay. Beyond the scanning coils you have the objective lens system again it is nothing but an electromagnetic lens which ensures that by controlling the magnetic field of those lenses you are able to focus the electron beam right on the specimen. Okay, the focus electron beam should converge right on top of the specimen. So, that is basically your focus in that case. The sample chamber is usually set apart from this SEM column. Now, why is that? Okay, now, you know that electrons have to move down this optic axis in a nearly centralized arrangement. So, they need to come right down the center of the optic axis. Now, if there is any gas present in the system the electron beams may tend to stray from the centralized location and further what might also happen is that the electrons may lose their energy in trying to ionize the gases because they will have bombardments with the atoms of the gas and that will slow them down. You do not want that to happen. So, you want to control this SEM system under a very high vacuum. So, this SEM column you need to have a very high vacuum.
to ensure that your elect electron beam does not stray, does not ionize any gases that may be present. So, you need to have a very high vacuum level in the electron beam chamber that means the SEM column. Okay. But once the electron beam comes onto the specimen, there are certain uh, cases in which we want to control the pressure inside the sample chamber because not all samples can be imaged under high vacuum conditions. For high vacuum to be possible, the samples that you image have to be completely dry, completely free of moisture. Okay. But in certain cases, for example, when you are evaluating biological samples right, which are wet, which may have water inside. Okay. Or sometimes if you want to image fresh cement paste, right, evolving properties of cement paste, in such cases you will have to control the pressure in the sample chamber because you cannot obviously have high vacuum when you have moisture present in your system because you are going to drive out the moisture that is going to clog all your uh, exits and so on because of which you will have complete breakdown of your microscope. So, you need to ensure that the sample chamber is capable of varying degrees of atmospheric pressures or varying de degrees of pressures not necessarily vacuum. In most conventional microscopes you will not have <coughs> different vacuums okay. that means that you will have to operate the sample chamber also at very low vacuum conditions or in other words very low pressure conditions or high vacuum conditions right. But in other cases when you are working with biological samples and when you want to do imaging of wet substances, you need to enable what is known as the environmental mode. In the environmental mode, you do not have a vacuum in the sample chamber. So, you are able to image the sample with respect to its original state, you do not need to actually alter the state to make the sample completely dry. Uh, the stage on which the sample sits or specimen sits is a stage which can be moved in the x and y directions as well as in the z direction and in some cases you also get stages that can be rotated because sometimes rotating can give you very distinct features of certain crystalline species. Okay. So, you can have a stage which has only three axes of rotation or sometimes it may have sorry three axes of movement or sometimes it may also be equipped with rotation capabilities. Okay. So, the rotation capability actually is there in the high end microscopes, you will have to actually order that specially to get the sample stage which can actually be rotated in, a, in addition to being moved in the x, y and z directions. Okay, we will take a look at each one of these components separately. So, first of all we need to understand that we need to have a good vacuum system in place. Okay. So, generally the vacuum system consists of a regular vacuum pump typically an oil based vacuum pump and there is also another system called a turbo molecular pump which is present within the SEM column. Now, depending upon the amount of reduction in pressure or extent of vacuum that you need okay, at certain points this oil based system will stop operating and the turbo molecular system will start operating this. Okay. And when the turbo molecular system starts operating it will then be able to evacuate the chamber to very low pressures so or very high vacuums. And again we need vacuum because the gases present in the SEM column can react with the electron source causing the electron source to be losing its energy basically burning out because it is spending all its energy in trying to ionize the atoms. Okay and then the beam becomes unstable because the atoms ionizing atoms will discharge okay. and the transmission of the beam through the electron optic column which will also be hindered by the presence of these gaseous molecules in the air. So, you need to completely evacuate which makes it very essential imperative to have a good quality vacuum system installed. In many microscopes one of the common reason which uh, makes the vacuum system ineffective is that uh, we sometimes do not control very well the sample preparation. If there is any moisture, if there are any loose powders in your sample which can fly off that can also affect your vacuum system because they clog the, uh, the evacuation uh, exits and so on and so forth. Because of that you need to ensure that you do not have any loose powders in your sample because in cementitious materials sometimes we have to work with loose powders, but we need to ensure that they are prepared sufficiently well so that they will not be sucked out when they 
when the chamber gets evacuated. Other thing is of course, you do not need, you should not use wet samples if your SEM does not have an environmental mode or a high pressure mode. So, for powdered samples typically what is done, uh, one aspect is to take a double sided tape, right? you stick it on a glass slide, take a double sided tape, spray the powder on it and then rub the powder onto the tape, so that it sticks properly to the tape. So, mostly what will happen is in such cases when you actually evacuate the chamber, the powder will be sufficiently well stuck to the tape, so that it does not come off. Okay. The other option is to take the powder and immerse it in epoxy and then you prepare a flat sample, polish it and then observe under the microscope. So, for powders that is the best way to do it, because if any loose powder is present on your tape, which you have not carefully removed, then this will start getting uh, into your evacuation points and then that will cause your vacuum system to start collapsing. Okay. And secondly, it will also lead to contamination of the chamber, which you do not want to happen. Yes. Yeah. So, with with fine with super fine materials like silica fume, the better method would be to embed an epoxy. Just take a container, a, a cylindrical container of uh, low viscous epoxy and put your powder into it. So, it is encapsulated properly, then you slice, prepare the sample and uh, prepare the specimen surface by polishing it and then image it. The electron beam speed is controlled by the potential difference that is applied between the electron gun and the anode. Right. So, that controls the electron speed. The movement of the uh, stage up or down only controls the working distance, that is the distance between the objective lens and the sample. The accelerating voltage is basically the potential difference which is applied between the electron gun and the anode. Now, to image different types of materials, we need different accelerating voltages. If you are trying to image something which is soft, right, we do not need extremely high accelerating voltages, because the higher the accelerating voltage, the greater will be the depth of penetration of the electron beam into the sample. Okay. So, appropriate voltage has to be chosen based on the system being investigated. Generally, most SEMs have a range between 200 volts and 30 kilo volts okay, or 0.2 kilo volts, that is 200 volts and 30 kilo volts, which is a very large operating range. Okay. That means, they are capable of imaging different types of systems. When you are looking at biological systems, you are operating at very low voltages, because most biological systems, we have single cell systems or uh, uh, very small uh, uh, cellular systems that you are trying to image with the scanning electron microscope. If you have very high energy electrons, they may tend to actually damage your entire sample itself, okay, because of the interactions your sample may actually get damaged. So, you want to reduce the voltage at which these electrons going are going down. But <coughs> when you are moving to dense systems like ceramics, like concrete, you have to adopt higher accelerating voltages, because what will happen if you go with very low voltages is that your beam penetration into the sample will be very limited. And because of that, you are not going to get a good representative understanding of what that sample is made up of. So, if you want good beam penetration, you can operate at high operating voltages. So, high voltage, you get stronger contrast but you are also liable to get more surface charging, right? because these electron beams are going very fast down the optic axis and collecting on top of the sample. So, you need to ensure that when you are operating at very high voltages, you need to conduct the system properly, otherwise what will happen is the electrons will start building up on the surface. Now, you do not always need extremely high voltages when you work with concrete based systems, it depends on what type of imaging you are performing. If you are just doing a morphological imaging on the surface, your accelerating voltage does not have to be very high, because the beams are basically dislodging the secondary electrons present at the surface. We will look at that phenomenon in just a few minutes. But if you are trying to understand the compositional assessment of the phases that are present in your material, then you want the electron beam to at least penetrate some distance, so that you get some representative image of what you are actually observing. Right. So, for that you need to have a higher accelerating voltage. So, for most concrete applications, a voltage in the range of 15 to 20 kilo volts is suitable. For softer concretes, you may want to have lower voltages, but for most dense concretes, you will have to have 
higher voltages and for polymers you adopt lower voltages because obviously the polymers are much softer have lower elastic moduli as compared to concrete. High volume fly ash concrete just an example is provided for a softer uh, because high volume fly ash concrete because it gains strength much slower and probably never reaches the strength potential of 100 percent Portland cement concrete you may actually want to reduce the amount of accelerating voltage for such softer systems.